Today's podcast is supported by David Smith of Edward Jones. Are you happy with your financial strategy? Or maybe you'd like to see what other opportunities are out there. Or give David a call at 469-372-1587. That's 469-372-1587. David is only concerned about one person, that's you and your financial health. So check him out. David Smith, Edward Jones, 469-372-1587. Hey everybody, it's the Trout and hope you're having a great day and welcome to the Trout Show. Today's episode stars a very talented musician, originally from the UK, who makes her home now in America. And she was discovered at the ripe old age of 15 by Dave Stewart. Now, if you're not familiar with Dave Stewart, is he was part of the Eurythmics, but he's also very well known for producing some very talented musicians, like our guest today, Joanne Shaw Taylor. Joanne started playing and liking Stevie Ray and really got into the blues. That's what she wanted to play, and she continues to do that now with her band as she tours across the United States and to Europe. But it's not just a blues artist or blues guitar. She also writes some some poppy kind of stuff too that she likes, but. She's helped along by people like Joe Bonamassa. She's played and opened up for people with Steve I and Jeff Beck, some very well-known musicians. And the reason why is because she's very talented. And I think you'll like her music, but I think you'll like her story because she has some funny things to talk about that. So up next, the gal that studied Stevie Ray and now plays like Stevie Ray, only better, Joanne Shaw Taylor. That's next on The Trout Show. Kind of discovered when you were how old were you like 12 or something like that uh when i met dave stewart i was 15. okay you're 15. so did you did you realize and this is something that I, i've always kind of intrigued me so did you realize at 15 that you had the skill that you had or you just kind of said were you kind of shocked in other words you're out playing i don't know i don't know the circumstances but it's been a while back but you're playing and stewart goes i think i want to help help you <laughs> Did, did it dawn on you at that point that you said, man, I must be good? Or how did it come about with your mind to go wrap yourself around that? I don't remember ever, which sounds a, a little obnoxious, but I don't remember being that, having that sort of pinch of ego that you. No, and I'm not saying you did. I mean, you know, you're just kind of playing. No, no, no. Um, but no, I don't think it ever really occurred to me. It never occurred to me that I couldn't do it and that I wasn't capable of learning how to play guitar and learn it well, but it never, um, I don't think it ever really occurred to me that I was better than anybody else or, and I still don't think I am. Um, I think it's always been for me just thankful that I found this means of expressing myself. You know, I knew that that was going to um, be very therapeutic in life, you know, and a, a giant benefit, but also open up my world. You know, I grew up in a very small English village. Um, wasn't, you know, particularly, it was very white Church of England school. You know, there wasn't a great mix of cultures. What part of the country did you grow up in? Uh, I grew up in a village called Cheswick Green, which is, which in is close Sol to Solihull. Hall. So it's Stratford upon Avon, Birmingham. Okay, I hope that. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, but lots of farmland and, you know, the village and everyone who lived in the village went to the school, you know, so we were all, it's like its own little world. Um, so I, I knew it would open up my world in terms of meeting lots of different people and, travel um so i think i was more sort of focused on that than um yeah i don't think i ever thought i was good i think i was you know when even like dave i've kind of thought mm, probably an idiot you know to think that <laughs> but i'll go with it you know <laughs> well i assume you knew who he was 
when you saw I, him, did you? I didn't. I you didn't. didn't. I was in my bedroom and he, so we'd done a charity gig in aid of breast cancer because my mum had just been having, receiving treatment for it at the time. And, mm -hmm. um, a friend of Dave was that was there and passed on a little demo CD I'd done to him. So we phoned the house the next day and my dad burst into my bedroom. I remember I was watching a Steve Ray Vaughan DVD and jamming along. Um, <laughs> oh my God, Dave Stewart's on the phone. I'm like, I don't know who that is. <laughs> like, the so I'm like, I don't know who that is. Of course, your dad knew who he was, but you yeah. did. <laughs> but that He's like, Annie Lennox. I'm like, sounds familiar. Like, <laughs> And he's like, anyway, he, he wants you to go to London tomorrow. We're going to London and he wants to sign you to a record deal. I was like, cool, can I get on with my video? Um, you know, just usual kind of, well, they seem happy. So. But you know what? Here's the thing. This has happened to me. When you when you get up my age group and you start talking to people, this is a few years ago. So I was at a college. I'm, I'm 10 minutes away from one of the biggest universities in Texas, okay? It's a liberal arts. People, very famous people have gone to school there. You know, the guy from Eagles, Paul Schaefer that played with Letterman, all those guys, they all went there. So I went up and watched a band. This has been a few years ago. And I walked up to the guy that was playing the band. I said, you sound a lot like, um, oh, my gosh, now that the, the lead guitar, I can't remember his name now, the lead guitar player from Queen. I can see him. The Brian May. Brian May. I said, you listen. And he goes, who's that? And I'm like, you don't know who Brian May, Queen? I got a clue. So it's kind of the same thing. You're me in Rhapsody. <laughs> so, no, I didn't go into that. So it's the same thing with you. Yeah, I just kind of walked away and went, okay. Well, in my defense, I was 15 years old. And my well, I mean, yeah, he was in yeah. college, but still. So, <laughs> all right. So from there, was that when the ball started rolling for you? Was you that young when you go and was it, 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 it the kind much, of, it, okay. it was um, looking back, the ball started rolling and I thought it was going in that direction. And then after about three years, the, the ball abruptly stopped, mm -hmm. um, which I think was the best thing that ever happened to me. So the label went bust before I could release any material. And I sort of retreated back to my parents' house and uh, got a part-time job in a pub. I mean, my parents were fantastic. They're always very, very supportive. So it was, uh, the deal was, look, we're not going to charge you rent. You know, if you get a job that's enough to pay for your car insurance and your phone and pocket money, you know, yeah. um, we'll let you live here for free and you can spend the weekdays working on your music. Um, and that took about another four years of kind of learning to write songs and, and gigging and getting a good band together. Uh, and then I uh, reached out to Thomas Roof and signed. So it was the ball got rolling and I had this sort of amazing experience of opening up for BB King and being on the road with Dave and tour buses and go in every European city you can think of and art galleries. And and then all of a sudden I was in a village in Northamptonshire not doing anything <laughs> um, and having no money and any money I could scrounge. It was and you're telling them, hey, guess who I just played with? And they went, yeah, but you're here now. It's you're, Yeah, you're not which was junior. great. It was really humbling and it really, um, you know, changed my work ethic, I think, you know, understanding how hard this industry is and how persevering you have to be, you know, and getting in a mini with three which i don't know you're american if you remember the old minis with a fender baseman on the the side seat with a duvet wrapped around it and drive in <laughs> 10 hours to glasgow because your car only goes 40 miles an hour yes. um, and doing yes. a gig and driving back home um you know it's good it, i'm i wouldn't want to do it again but i'm glad no but it. you you know but the thing about it is and and a lot of people don't understand this because the way the world is on the internet now you can put something on youtube and go viral yeah. And everybody goes, Oh, look, hey, you know, and you don't and you don't pay that dues. Yeah, I mean this you pay space, certainly pre Facebook. You know, and the thing about it was that's I, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I've been playing guitar for fifty years. Mm -hmm. And I just I and I had an opportunity when I was twenty years old to go and meet with some very famous people. And my brother talked me into going to university and I said, Okay, well and then I got married, blah, blah, blah. But I never wanted to be these guys that you just got through saying. Get in, a, get in a van or a mini or something with three other people or four other people, travel from town to town, getting in a room and maybe eating peanut butter and jelly or whatever it is just for the next gig and pray to God that something happens. And therefore, I never got where I wanted to go. And, and so now, fast forward to now, I am now interviewing people like you that I can talk about it and say, OK, but You're you smart. paid your dues. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I know I get to watch That's all you people. You're smart. You had you went for the proper job, 
and didn't well, spend. Well, I did, but you know, still. But you know, I went to yourself. corporate America. But I still am a player, and I still record and produce. Blah blah blah. So, but you, you, you know, the thing about it is, and you got through saying this. I, I think for me, when it comes to people like you that's on tour all the time, Walter is a prime. Walter Trout's a prime example. Okay, he goes between here and then he goes to. You know, Europe, he goes on tour, which you're going on in about a month. I know to say, always look at people's tour dates. Mm -hmm. You get a little break and then you go to St. Louis after today and then you're going home. Oh, yeah. then, you go to, then you go to Europe. It's, it's not a lie for everybody. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think the other thing too is when you're as good as you are, Joanne, and people expect you. Mm -hmm. every night when you walk on stage to be the best you can, which not necessarily you're not going to be, but you're human. And, yeah. and there are dates you don't feel good and all that stuff. So I always admire people like yourself that are on the road all the time that continually, and like you said, you, I don't know where I am. I know where I am, but I don't know what date it is. Yeah. So I appreciate that. What motivates you still? You've been on tour now for years. Mm -hmm. What keeps you going? And, and, and I know, you know, you get paid to do it and people think, young people think, oh, it's great. I'll get in front of 20,000 people or th that one. Your gigs might be a thousand or 2,000, whatever you're playing in. What it keeps you motivated? What keeps you pushing down the road? Well, I think two things I'll say to that, which is one, just picking up on your previous point about, you know, um, being able to perform, you know, to the standards you want to perform. Um, because I do like to say to younger artists, because there, there was a time for, you know, 15 years where I felt like I had to do everything. You know, I was already cool managing and driving the van some of the time and mm -hmm. loading the gear. And then it's not just the show. It's the meet and greet afterwards and signing all the CDs. And that's it's a lot of work. work. It's work. It, it is. And it's also, you know, if you've got 30 gigs to get through. The best way of catching a cold, which is means you're not singing, yeah. is by going and shaking a lot of hands and being sure around. Sure, it is. People. Yeah, and it's you know it's great if you can do it when you're building your audience. But I always like to tell younger artists, particularly females, because I think as a female in a, a male-dominated industry, there's still that thing of you're seen as being a diva if you're just putting your foot down. Um, but look after yourself. You know, at the end of the day, your job is to perform your art and entertain people and give them something, some happiness or energy or whatever you feel it is. So if you can't do that and do the meet and greets and do the interviews, then don't do them. <laughs> it's, you know, put your foot just, down. Just don't wa just walk off the stage and be done with it, I guess, to certain Yeah, degree. go and do your, have a shower, do your yoga, do yeah. your vocal cool down, talk to your partner, whatever it is that's, you know, that's your job. You've got to look after yourself and it's a, no one's going to look after you in this no. business. No one's going to no. keep asking you to for more and more. So, yeah. Um, but in terms of what motivates me, I think it's always been the same thing. I've never felt competition with other guitar players. I know coming up, the boys are, are very competitive <laughs> with each other. Um, my main thing was always trying to figure out how I can be the best person I can be, best person, best musician, best partner, best you know, daughter. Um, I have control over that. I don't have a control over how successful anyone else is. So no. I think it's also being on that journey of, I like the fact that my albums change. You know, when I look back at my albums, they all sound like Joanne Shaw Taylor, but they do sound like 22 year old Joanne and 38 year old Joanne, <laughs> you know? So it's, uh, I think it's about the journey as much as, as anything for me of, of it's kind of documenting my life, I suppose, when I look back. But there's no destination. When yeah. you think about it, there is no destination. No, you, I, I mean, where I'm going to go musically, maybe I'll decide to do an acid jazz album one day. I'm sure I will. Well, I, I, and you know, more. the thing about it is what you do as a blues person myself is you got to do more than one, four, five. I mean, yeah, there's, a, there's, there so has, there's a lot in that, which is why I play it. Yeah. But I mean, I always say that I'm a blues guitarist, but not a blues artist, um, which I think stems from the fact that, you know, growing up, all my influences were male guitar players sure. and the guitar is a gender neutral instrument i can you know try and sound like stevie or albert um but when it came to singing i couldn't sound like that so i had to go find other influences and predominantly females were in different genres you know soul and pop and, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and you know sort of classic rock stevie nicks etc so i really had to kind of you know adapt from blues to be able to to figure out how to sing and write songs. But you have uh, that. You're lucky though. 
an aspect that your voice kind of fits into that. You have a deeper voice. You're an mm-hmm. alto. I guess you'd get considered an alto singer, I guess. Yeah. And when you're singing, you're not, you know, if you're singing like some of the Steve, well, of course, Stevie Nicks got that different voice too. But when you're doing pop singing, it's higher because of the female register. But you've mm-hmm. got more of that that thing that you can do because it's just natural for you. That's just your voice. I'm, I'm more on the Adele, Adele spectrum than I there am. There you go. That's, a good, right that's a good area. <laughs> good person to compare yourself to (laughs) well and you know and so that you know if you keep motivating i think that's the thing when you think about it we're just talking about jeff beck but the the destination is jeff beck i mean in other words that's it when you're done you're done and then you hopefully you get to meet jimmy in person somewhere above above or jeff and go hey remember me Concerned about your financial health? Then reach out to David Smith with Ever Jones. 469-372-1587. That's 469-372-1587. He can conduct business where you are. Get your financial health checkup with David Smith with Ever Jones. His number one concern is you. That's David Smith with Ever Jones. 469-372-1587. Yeah. See, and, um, and but the thing about it too for me is when people like you perform, then you've got the other thing to go with it. Like you just said at the beginning before we started recording, I'm working on a new. I'm you're constantly working on new stuff, mm-hmm. and and one of my fears, and it's got to be worse for somebody like you, that one day that well that creative thing's going away. I mean, you yeah. you can sit down and write a song, but can you write a song? Yeah, you know? that's always. I always take a little break after writing. I always say writing's like turning on a tap. You know, you've got to wait for the warm, water to get warm and then eventually the water tank's going right. to run out of hot water and it goes cold again. Yep. You know, maybe your first idea is it's like, oh my God, that's just a copy of another song I did <laughs> 10 years ago, but worse. Yeah. Um, so you always have those anxieties. But And for COVID, for instance, I couldn't find anything to write about during COVID, um, which is why I did the blues album, did a covers album. Um so yeah, it's a worry, but you know, when it runs out, it runs out, and I don't know. I'll go foster some puppies or do something. <laughs> well, but <laughs> you know, you're at home a shelter or something. You know, the other thing though is, and this is what I've seen a trend now more. I think is the meet and greet. Mm-hmm. You know, and people saying, "Well, I love you," or "I think your music's great." I, that just fills your tank up every time. I would imagine when you're going out and shaking I love hands. It. And- I love meeting people. I genuinely do. Which if anyone's been following my career for a long time, I think they'll know that I wasn't particularly very good at meeting people in the early days. And looking back, I think it was a bit of a combination of I was so young and the fan base was predominantly men much older mm-hmm. than me. And, you know, if you're thinking like you're a 13 year old girl, all the guys I've met were like either family figures, you know, uncles, yeah. dads, or authority figures like school teachers. Right. So to have like these guys coming up to you wanting to talk to you and shake your hand and have it was a bit kind of you know the walls went up a little bit True. um and then i kind of got used to that i suppose and then covid did me the world of good because i just sort of rested for two years and you know was pretty burned out so i came back with uh a lot more enthusiasm and also i'm older now so if anything creepy happens i'll just tell them they're creepy <laughs> so <laughs> you know whereas when you're a 24 year old girl it's like oh, okay everybody's creepy when you're 24 years old <laughs> <laughs> Now, Pretty when you're much. older, it's when you get my age, people don't care. In other words, it, it, there's there's a time when you get whether I don't know about the oh, female I get that side. At 35. Of, it's it's not- yeah <laughs> yeah they just kind of like and I'm not talking about that part, but it's just like oh he's not going to hurt anything if he wants to come back in the back behind the stage, let him, you know because what is he going to do? Come on, he's not going to be bothering anybody. And and so that that's you know I I just think that when you when you do what you do and you do it all the time, it's it's a it's it's work. And when I talk to young people, I always tell them the same thing. It's the business of music, you know, and there's just yeah, so many you know, ways. There's, there's so many other, you know, I mean, my grandparents were coal miners. That's a job. Wow. You know, I go talk to people and shake my shake hands with people who already like me before they meet me. <laughs> you know, so it's that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Um, they don't know who you are, but that's that, you know, and that's the one thing I've always said to myself when I meet famous people is sometimes... I don't want to meet them because yeah. then you find out what they're like. And it, and if like, if I had a chance, if I'd met Jeff or even somebody like Pete Townsend, Eric Clapton, people I've been looking at for years, I, you know, 
I just walk up and say, Hey, appreciate your music. What, you know, what else you going to say? You know, cause yeah. it's like, cause if you ever start having talking with, you might go, I don't like that person. I wish I'd never mm-hmm. visited with them. But well, that's always the risk, particularly with social media, you know, yeah. trying to get your personality across, which for me is a very British sense of humor, which can go one way or the other with Americans <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Particularly with like religion in this country. It's like, dude, you got to bet. Oh, go, no. Go watch Monty Python films and then you might understand where I'm coming from. But um, I was just telling, uh, so was I talking about that the other day? A young person. I think it was like my granddaughter about Monty Python or somebody young. And I said, you need mm-hmm. to go watch Monty Python. And I was quoting from one of the movies. I don't remember which one it was. Yeah, we watched. Uh, How to I Go think it was the meaning. I think it was the meaning. I know it's one of the skits I remember seeing. I go and they're like, "Who's Monty Python?" I said, "Never mind. You don't. You don't need to." Uh. All right. So, question number two is: Well, I got more than one question, but I mean, why did you decide? I got nothing against the city. But what <laughs> was the what attracted you to Detroit? Uh, it was just fate, really. I'd I'd always wanted to tour the states. I'd always wanted to live here. Um, which I think is down to what, two things. One, all my influences were American. Yeah, you know, you were saying about you got into the blues through the Stones, and I think there was that exchange of yeah. Americans getting into the Stones and Zeppelin, and you know, John Mayall, and then us Brits getting into you know the Texas stuff and Chicago. So I'd always wanted to live here for that reason, um, and the other reason being I was from a country that's you know this big and surrounded by water, so it's you feel oh. grow up feeling very isolated. Yeah. Or I did. Um, so the idea that there was this massive landmass that you could tr- traverse without having to go through borders, you know, unlike mainland Europe, mm-hmm. um, just sounded wonderful, particularly for touring. Um, so I was doing a gig in England, in Worcester, and I had a support band and they were from Detroit. And um, we got talking, we, we kept in touch. And eventually I'd done White Sugar about the following year on Roof, said look thomas roof doesn't tour european artists in america it's too expensive Mm. but um i've saved up some money i'm going to try and get the visa if i book some gigs you know and route it out of detroit can you help me with you know a van and a rehearsal space and back line and would you be the van yeah so we did and i managed to get the visa in two weeks worth of gigs and then we got an agent off the back of that which booked another six-week tour with eric sardinas so we rooted it again out of detroit and so we just kept I just so you just going. stayed there. That yeah, and then, you yeah. know, I mean, I was like 22, so all my friends had gone to university. One was in Australia, one was in Barcelona, you know. Um, Prospera, yeah. It was like, you know, there's nothing really for me in the UK. And by the time, I'm, you know, I got based in America and came back, those friends had now had children and got married. And yeah. So it's you just you. You're the, you're the odd man person that's like, she's a musician. Yeah. I want to meet my family. Uh, Here's my kids. What do you do yeah. for a living? I, I go to, I'm a, a chartered accountant every day. I go, you know. Yeah, I've, I've got like 10 honorary honorary nieces and nephews at this point. Um, <laughs> so. And I love them all, but they know Annie JoJo's on tour. <laughs> when did you decide? Because I, I watched some of your videos, obviously. I try to watch everybody before I interview them because I'm, I'm a guitar pro. I'm a Les Paul guy. Okay. But I do have some strat stuff when I want single coil stuff on a record mm-hmm. you play a telly a lot but mm-hmm. i noticed it has humbuckers in it it does but i never use them i only so ever use that you use the one by the bridge is that the, you use the standard every stock on every guitar i ever play it's always in the bridge position and i never change it never touch the volume never touch the tone never touch the pickup so and and what was it about the telly that you like about it um, it was intentional, to be honest. My first guitar was a Strat. Um, mm. you know, the kid that was obsessed with Stevie. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. And also, I think as a lot of blues guitarists of my generation will attest to, that was a big, you know, the Steve, oh, Stevie freak, you know. Um, yeah, you got like, to have To sound like him too much, even though he's a massive influence. Um, so it was Albert Collins, really. I gravitated. That and Johnny Lang, actually, had just oh. come out which was a great influence for me because it was so nice to see someone nearly my age out there touring and doing it, you know? Um, So between the two of them, I just thought one, I sound less like Stevie when I'm on a telly. Right. Um, And B, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with it because of Albert and and Johnny. Do you, do you push it much? Do you use, I'm not a real big pedal fellow person that much. Do you use that many stuff on the floor? 
I got um one tube screamer and a reverb pedal. That's it. I, maybe I always say this. Maybe it's a female thing, but I just there's so much going on up there between the sound and organizing the band and thinking about where we're at in the set and what's coming <laughs> up next and what I'm switching to and is that audience member okay? They look like they're passed out. Do I need to call a show stop? Do, that why do I want to have to worry about pu- pushing buttons? It's I got that's, enough. I've um, never heard it described that way, but that's that's very that's interesting. And I'm a woman, so I'm doing it in a, in a heel. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> like really, I want to make my life more complicated. It's fine. But you know, blues players are not known to put a bunch of crap on there anyway. No, I mean, and you know what? It's just that I don't need something else to be wasting my money on. No, <laughs> and what do you what do you use? Typical? What's your amps that you use it? Push it out. Of? I got a sixty-one Fender Bassman and a sixty-two Fender Bassman pickup. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and do you, this is just for my edification anyway, what, what size strings do you use? I use the Ernie Ball, um, so they're uh, skinny top, heavy bottom, so they're 10s okay. on the bottom and okay. 11s on the top. Um, I tried to do the thing of 11s and 12s when I was younger and it's, no. this, this is not powerlifting kind of thing. <laughs> Chipolata. Well, I play nines because I just got, you know, you just, it's easier for me because I do a lot of bending. And of course, when you're playing a Les Paul, that's all about this massive piece of wood that you run through it and want to then sustain. Yeah. And I do a lot of, my wife always watches me and goes, your hand doesn't stop. And I go, yeah, I'm always doing <laughs> auto on it. You know how that goes. And and then occasionally, though, don't you throw a, a you, do you carry a Les Paul with you too? Or do you, is it mostly? I do, yeah. I switched to a Les Paul, um, I think it was like 2012. And I did the almost always never album. Um, my, I felt like my playing had got stagnant, so I kind of mixed it up and changed picks. So I went to the little jazz threes. Oh, the small ones, playing, yeah, yeah, and started playing a uh, Les Paul just to kind of f- find, you know, refresh. Yeah, yeah. Um, which did my playing a lot of good. I tidied up my right hand. It was a bit sloppy before that. Um, and yeah, just uh, and then shortly after that, I did that for a couple of years, and then telly suits me a lot better. But sometimes you just need a guitar that sounds like a Les Paul. You know? <laughs> well, I understand that. But occasionally, I like the whammy bar just to drop down, just to give it a little step. But no, no Eddie Van Halen stuff for me because I never could figure that out too. Isn't it? And all that tapping stuff, I can do. Yeah, it, but no, it's that's, like, a, that's about my pay grade. I, I yeah, it's like I suck at it. I can't. I just you know why and why turn you know turn it up to eleven and blow it out or whatever and and the thing about blues is most of the people that play blues pretty the people i grew up watching they didn't you know pb king but the guys on mm. tour i think he uses uh i think he's maybe he may use a compressor or distortion or something like that but he didn't do anything you know in no. fact his stuff is pretty thin when he plays because yeah. he plays on that strat and he plays i think he plays at the bridge pickup all the time and yeah it's, it's quite a classy tone isn't it and and I think the other thing about you though you've had, you've been fortunate to be able to work some very well known artists. I mean that yeah. that but that you know and I, and I tell those people all the time when you're of your quality it's not because you suck <laughs> it's because you're really good at what you do. I mean seriously. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't thank you. Um, you know, I mean, again, for any young guys listening, it's it's one of two things. One. I suppose I'm good at what I do. I, it pains me to say it. I'm British. Don't quit. I know you're British. Come on. At least you're not Canadian. Um, Come on. Yeah. That's, I've got a Canadian keyboard player and I never stop referring to him as the Canadian. <laughs> um, and then the other thing is I'm a nice person. I'm professional. I'm easy to work with. You're British. Come on. You just got through saying that you're British. Come on. <laughs> But it's what, um, what else is there? it makes a big difference. The amount of kids that you know coming up that are just so full of ego and such a nightmare. And guess who gets you got to hire a support slot? Your name's Joe Bonamassa, and you need to support. Who's he going to hire? Me, because I'm going to turn up and be professional. All my guys are great. He knows I'm going to respect the stage times. Job done. You are who you are. Yeah, and, and I've always tried to stress that particularly because often I get compared to other female artists. Um, sometimes in a positive way, like, oh, if you like Joanne, you'll like Sam Fish. And sometimes in a negative way, people who love Sam don't like me because they think I'm competing with her. Uh, firstly, me and Sam's one of my best friends, adore her. 
um you know i'm just glad there's another girl out there that understands my life to be honest you know um have you met have you met our texas gal ali venable yet yeah we did um actually me and sam did a few dates with her on um the devon allman tour she's a sweetheart really i haven't great. met her yet but i i know she's I close to me yeah and um but yeah it's that thing of particularly women you know men competing women against each other and it's like this is the one thing that we're not competitive in just because you buy a Sam Fish album doesn't mean you can't buy a Joanne Shaw Taylor one. Yeah. And the only time that we're ever in competition would be if we're in the same town on the same night with playing the same at different price. gigs. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're, comp- you're competing. But even then you'll probably just go, well, I'll go see Sam this time and I'll see Joanne next time. You know, it's so, yeah, it's not, no one ever buys a Led Zeppelin album and refuses to listen to Rolling Stones because they've bought a Led Zeppelin album, you know. So but I'm going to tell you something, Joe, and you know this. Americans just love a British accent. They go gaga over it. It's the only reason I'm having the, the minimal success I'm having here. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm exotic. No, you're not. Come on. I mean, it I'm came with exotic. me with the Beatles. Yeah. yeah. You know, my, my aunt was my 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 aunt was from lived in Denver, which is where you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. And she was a world war two bride. My oh, okay. uncle went over and married her over there and brought her over. And so I was kind of used to it. And then when he started hearing the Beatles and they're singing and all of a sudden, hello, Paul. And you're like, what the, what's that? Where did that come from? How come their voice doesn't why does it change like this that? Is, this is nothing to do with music, but you've just reminded me my nanny Vera, my grandmother, my, paternal grandmother yeah well if you asked her about world war ii she'd just say oh god it was the best time of my life <laughs> like yeah she's like oh i had a job i was working on building tanks in a factory i was oh, thin, yeah. rationing yeah. your your granddad had buggered off and there was an abundance of young american sailors she said it was the best time of my life <laughs> like all right thanks, isn't that yeah. funny though so you moved over you've been over here in america for quite some time uh yeah 2009 so be 14 oh, years yeah. so, so long you, to anywhere to be honest yeah that's true and then you know it's funny i was going to ask you at the beginning but <clears throat> excuse me but i figured i didn't need to ask after your dad said something because i i kind of envision you living in this small community in the uk mm-hmm. here you here's did would they have your nickname did they call you joanny or did they call you jo, did, it, was, did you uh, have a nickname jojo jojo so Jojo's in her bedroom, listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan, <laughs> and all your friends are listening to what? What were they listening to back then? I was trying to think what they probably I don't really remember them listening 80s to the, stuff. I remember they got excited because we went to the, see the Backstreet Boys. Oh yeah, that was that um, time. Yeah, yeah. But my friends were great, actually. And it's the two friends I mentioned earlier. One, the one who went to Barcelona, and the one still in Australia. So Helen and Liz. Um, Helen and Liz would both. I would always listen to. So we have to wear school uniforms, blazers. Mm, mm, so I'd have yeah. my headphones through the sleeve or like up the back and then put my hair over it so you can yeah, so see, see it. Yeah. the blues and making notes. And they'd always cover for me, like if they knew the teacher was about to ask a question and they'd just write it down and give me the answer. I'm going, Taylor, are you listening? What's the, you know, capital? Oh, those are good merits. friends you yeah. got. Those yeah. are good friends. Um, but they'd come to gigs with me too. Um and Liz now has two little ones, Alf, uh, Artie and Edith, and they know Artie Jojo plays the tar, as they call it. And, um, you know, they see my videos on YouTube and stuff. So, Well, it's, and, you know, I mean, what I was going to ask, and then you mentioned it, your dad came in and said, Dave Stewart's on the phone. I, kn- I already knew he was he liked what you did because he was a – Yeah, he's a – well, he played guitar and harmonica too. Um, like yourself, he was sensible when he got a proper job and, you know, managed to raise a family. <laughs> So you take how long you you take a break for how many weeks before you go to Europe? Do you like, um I, well depends what you mean by break. The well, you I still got to work. You got to get ready to go. Obviously. Well, also the the day I get home, I'm going to pick up my new dog. <laughs> so, which is a puppy. What kind of dog are you getting? I'm getting a miniature dash hunt. Okay. Um, if it was up to me, I'd go to the nearest pound um, and get whatever old thing needs a good home. But unfortunately, I need. I've always wanted to do that, but I put off having a dog because obviously I need something small enough to travel with. And then I finally thought. I was going to say, you're, you're taking the dog with you. Yeah. So Is I it a puppy or is it, is it, a, is puppy. it a puppy? 12 weeks. So uh, I'm going to have some sleepless nights ahead of me. Um, and then I've got to do, I'm doing a new album. So 
Yeah, and I think my fan base have always been very clear of like, look, I'm always going to record what I want to record because the alternative is recording what I think people want me to record. Yeah, and then I'm just chasing something fake that, you know, I, I got to play what I feel and I can't make you feel something if I don't feel it. You yeah. know, have and a then, great show tonight, Joanne. Thank you very much. You. Take care. Lovely to See talk you. to you and be well. You too. Bye bye. Bye. That's it for this episode of The Trout Show. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it very much. A special thank you to our guest today, Joanne Shaw-Taylor. I hope you watch her and follow her on YouTube. Or go to her website for more information, joanneshawtaylor.com. Special thanks and reach out to David Smith for supporting our channel as always. And remember, if you want to get more information about The Trout Show, visit us at our website where you can find all the information about our podcast and our YouTubes. That's it, www.thetroutshow.com. Thanks for listening. Until next time, remember, it's only rock and roll, but I love it. See ya. See ya.